Great. Thanks, Beth, for that. Um, so yeah, we are going to start off with uh, an example of a video. We're going to ask you for your feedback. Um, and I just want to note that we are today actually using a live PowerPoint. It's a little bit awkward to stick videos into your Zoom. So we're going to ask you to stretch your imagination a little bit and just imagine that this would be a video presentation. So here is our video presentation. And as you can see, the chart on the left shows the cost of various technologies when projected carbon dioxide allowance and prices are included. We're talking about CO2 allowance costs today. Um, projected carbon dioxide allowance prices are roughly $50 per ton in 2025. And this increases variable costs of existing plants powered by fossil fuels to the point where many are likely to shut down. So the take home point here is simply that incentives for carbon capture and storage for coal plants will allow advanced coal with carbon capture and storage to infiltrate the market more quickly. So we're just gonna pause there and give you a moment to write any initial suggestions that you might have in terms of how we could improve this little 30 second video um, in the chat. And, uh, and please be honest. All right, so we're seeing a lot of comments about it's being, uh, it's too busy, there's far too text. People are feeling a little overwhelmed. What are the key points? I said the key points though. <laughs> <laughs> so I was actually talking during that um, and you probably imagined that you were um, not hearing a lot of what I was saying because you were so focused on how busy the graph was, trying to locate what it was that I was saying um, and figure out what the heck was going on. So. Um, today, obviously, this is a bit of an extreme example, but we're going to go over some pointers that um, are really going to help you up your visual game in slides and match um, what it is that you show with what it is that you say to create effective instructional videos. So today our outcomes are first, though, to talk about the key questions to make when you're deciding to make an educational video. Videos are time intensive, so we want to give you some ideas about um, where you might go and what you might do instead of creating a video, what, because it takes a lot of time. We'll talk about the importance of storyboarding your videos and having a plan. And we will also talk about, again, applying those principles of visual design to educational video planning. Okay, and just a little caveat. Today we're focusing on instructional videos. So these are kind of more formal videos. They're videos that you would create for, for a long-term impact rather than just a check-in video, which is very quick and informal or something like a muddiest points video is where you recognize throughout the week that you need to just pop in there and clarify a point and you create a, a quick video. So today we're really looking at those formal instructional, instructional videos. And now I'm gonna turn things over to Beth to talk a little bit about no, not everything needs a video. This could be, we debated just stopping the uh, presentation here, but we will keep going. This is a key point to think about. Um, and so we're going to talk about when it's an optimal time to invest your time and energy into creating a video because not everything needs a video. So it's a common belief that the most effective way to reach students is through video content. And it's not necessarily true. And as you probably know, it's time consuming to create video content and it can be overwhelming. So here are some times when you may want to add a video. One is when you want to add instructional presence to your class. For example, the introduction to the week's materials, the summary of what's been covered, or clarifying concepts that the students are struggling with. As we mentioned, though, we're not focusing as much on that style of video, those check-in style videos today, we're focusing more on presenting content. Um, and sometimes you might actually want to add a little bit of instructor presence to your content presentation as well. But you really want to ask yourself, is this an important moment to build connection? Um, and I'll just point out right now, as I ask that question, um, I put a little handout into the chat and I can put it in again later for those who um, joined late that add, has these questions for you to ask yourself and summaries of the rest of our content as well. So the second reason why you might want to create a video is to visually demonstrate or, a or explain a concept or skill. So ask yourself, is it a concept students find complicated? 
Is it demonstrating a process or a relationship between concepts and do I need to animate it? Finally, you might choose video if you're creating a video that you want to have lasting power. So for example, it's not focused on a specific current event that next year you'll say, okay, this isn't relevant this year. Um, you don't wanna invest your time on creating um, a video for presenting content that you'll only use once. You might invest your time on creating a little check-in video that you'll only use once, but those are a lot quicker to produce. Here we want to focus on content that we can use in future years, whether that's in another online version of your course or a blended version or something or maybe extra help for students on tough concepts. So the point is that creating videos is time intensive. So consider the multiple other ways of sharing information before deciding on a video. So for example, of other approaches that you might take, you might use someone else's video. There are great videos out there already. You might use text and images. So if it's a fairly simple um, concept, oftentimes it can be replaced with a simple short lesson on your OWL site of text and images. Use activities like discussion or reflection to get students coming up with some of the ideas themselves. Use, ask students to do some research and report back, either in small groups or on a specific topic themselves. Use examples or cases or create a video. So it's one of several options that you have for sharing content. The other thing that we want you to think about is that um, sharing the content isn't the whole story. So then you wanna ask yourself the question of, regardless of these various modes that I might choose for sharing content, how do I ask students to engage with them? So there's multiple options that, oh, sorry, the one thing I wanted to mention as well is when using other people's um, videos or other people's um, uh, content or readings, the other thing that you do is include other voices in your teaching as well, which is a positive thing. So you can think about, is there a way that I can get broader perspectives than just my own by using someone else's materials as well? So just an extra little plus. So regardless of the way that you share information, you will want to think about how you ask students to engage, especially if it's a more passive activity like watching a video. So consider asking students a few short questions to test their understanding. Uh, or ask them to complete a reflection, uh, muddiest point, which is the thing that they don't quite understand by the end of it, um, brainstorms, discussions, and so on. And so the key here is that there's a cycle between sharing content and that's paired with active learning and asking students to engage with that content. So no matter what content, uh, you, uh, way of sharing content that you choose, you wanna use active learning to engage students with the content and also chunk material into smaller pieces and ask students to um, engage, reflect, um, and make meaning from that information. So on to our design principles. So we had that little message that we couldn't help uh, but go ahead and talk about videos without talking about really being super aware of the reasons uh, why you're choosing to invest the time in making a video. But now you've decided this, this topic really needs a video. And so now we have some design principles that help students learn. And remember, it's a video, so it should be animated. And you'll see in our examples um, that we keep that thread going throughout. So I'm gonna pass it back to Stephanie to talk about our first design principle. Yeah, and I just want to reiterate what Beth was saying there. Um, one of the lovely things about making a video is it's a visual medium. So always be thinking about, um, is this a concept that I'm teaching that really requires a visual medium? And if you are, and it's a video that implies motion, so animation um, should be fundamental in the creation of what you're making. If the animation is not necessary, then it may not be the time to invest in making uh, a video. So let's look at some of these. So avoid redundancies on slides. Um, this is some of the things that you saw in the first clip, but we're gonna give you um, an example of another one. I'm from, uh, music is my background, so you're getting a music example here. So I'm going to teach you how to assemble a trombone in this little video clip. Um, first of all, you are going to take that trombone, you're going to put it, uh, the bell in your left hand and the slide in your right. You want to insert the slide into the bell and then tighten the nut at the top. 
for the next step, um, you're going to insert that mouthpiece into the slide and turn it one quarter turn. And then you are now ready to play your trombone. So on the, on the surface, this looks pretty straightforward, um, but we're going to um, tell you a few principles here. Can I just, sorry. Oh, yeah, thanks. <laughs> we wanted to ask you first where your attention was. So I just launched a quick poll and you can just answer there and we'll see what you were focused on. going to give folks five more seconds. We've got lots of answers already. Okay. I'm just going to share the results with folks. Pass it back over to you, Stephanie. Okay. So we can see here that we have some people who are looking at the written text and the narration, some people who are switching back and forth, and some people who are trying to divide um, the narration and the image. So we actually have a principle here um, that speaks to um, how people perceive these and you guys are actually fitting pretty nicely in here. And that principle, um, I'm just gonna get rid of this poll screen on my notes, um, is that what you're saying shouldn't compete with what you're looking at. So in this case, what I was saying was also echoing the text and then you're required to look at the image at the same time. And so you have to um, switch back and forth. And the redundancy principle indicates that for most of us, we, can't, we can read and we can listen, but we can't do both at once. The exception is short text and accompanying graphics. So if your slides are something that you can read, it's probably not the most appropriate time for a video. So if we're thinking many of us are recording narration over PowerPoint, just reading what's on the PowerPoint um, is asking students to split their attention. Think about when you're watching a movie, and this is when I, I love this example, you rarely ever see a movie with text in it. The exception that always comes to mind for me is Star Wars, when you see the text at the beginning. But even then, someone is not narrating that text. So when we think about videos, we very rarely see text or narration of text. When we do see the text, it's very short and it's there to quickly explain a point rather than to be the focus of the entire video. So we're gonna apply these videos to a new, a new lesson now on assembling the trombone and Beth's work in the PowerPoint here and she's up for the challenge. So um, the takeaway here is that graphic and narrations are more effective than graphic narration and on-screen text. So to assemble your trombone, you wanna hold that bell in your left hand and the slide in your right. You're gonna insert the slide and then tighten the nut. Step two, insert the mouthpiece into the slide and turn it one quarter turn. And then step three, you are ready to play your trombone. Oh, instructor okay. fail. It's really okay. epic when it gets right on time. But I got excited. <laughs> sharing, sharing, uh, sharing Zoom powers is always the uh, excitement <laughs> that we add to this. So, so the key way take the key takeaway here is decluttering the text. So you see the difference between when it's just the text and when it's the um, visual, and um, uncrowding that slide, which many of you saw in the, in the very first movie that we showed, and then rely on the visuals to show what it is that you're saying, um, rather than you telling the information with additional text. So Trevor, that's a great question. You can provide a script along with your videos um, or you can close caption as well. In fact, your, uh, for accessibility purposes, your videos should be closed captioned and students can also often download that script. Okay, moving on. The next one is visual cues. Um, so visual cues mean draw your viewers attention to whatever it is that you want them to focus on. And we've been using that kind of throughout here. The first one is headlines. So using headlines to message the core idea to viewers. And you can think of this like a newspaper. Um, newspaper titles often have a quick takeaway, whatever it is the primary thing that you wanna take away. So um, in this case, we want um, you to know that headlines message core ideas to viewers and you can see how we're using it in other ways. 
uh, these are more active in tone and they signal to the student what they should concentrate on on the slide. They also help you organize the slide because you want to have one headline per slide or per video. Um, and that will help you kind of break up things into more manageable chunks. The other thing you can do in your video is prepare outlines. Um, that lets the students know where they are within the actual learning and it helps them organize that information and then you can summarize it at the end to help them remind them what they've learned. And then the last thing I'm going to talk about here is pre-attentive attributes, um, which is just a, a fancy way of saying use that space on your page to draw students attention to where it is that they want to look. So it tricks and it draws their attention to exactly where you want them to go. So some common um, things we can see here is to use the groupings um, to enclose an image with a box or a line, which we see there, which is going to draw your attention right to it. And then using colored or patterns to make something stand out. Um, or visually breaking up um, an expectation and making it stand apart. And you can also use things like arrows if you have an image and you're animating to make the arrows point exactly where students want to look. So just something to keep in mind, where should my students look on this visual? Use something to make them look there other than your mouse. Okay, so takeaways, this is my summary. Um, I've talked about a couple of techniques here. Show, don't tell, declutter your slides, and direct your attention to where it is that you want students to look. Great. And I'm going to turn it over to Beth to talk about two more techniques. Great. And keep those questions coming. We will uh, review them. If, I don't, if we don't get to them during the session, which we're kind of uh, whipping through, so we have lots of Q&A time, we'll make sure that we come back to those chat questions at the end, although I see uh, your colleagues are also helping answer, which is awesome as well. So two more principles. The first is to place words close to corresponding graphics. So let's look at an example. So this is an example figure taken from an ecology paper. And I chose it because when you take something from a uh, journal article, for example, this is the layout that they often have. Um, and so I put it kind of directly onto the slide. Um, and um, the purpose of this slide is to show that when there's a high density of sea otters, there are no large sea urchins, whereas when there are no sea otters, urchins get up to quite a large size. So the way this is presented can work in a paper when there's time to spend interpreting it. You're sitting there, you're looking at the graphs, you're looking at the axes but it's harder to interpret in a video and you probably see that. You might hear the words that I'm saying, but you probably can't also interpret the graph at the same time. So let's look at an alternative way to present this figure by applying the principle of placing words close to corresponding graphics. So here we're going to look at sea urchins on two islands. Um, Chitka Island, which has no sea otters and, sh or, sorry, which has sea otters and Shemya Island, which does not. We'll start by looking at um, Chitka Island by looking at the number of sea urchins of various sizes. So on the X, urchin diameter, and on the Y, number of sea urchins. In this region, there are a lot of, sea, of small sea urchins, but no very large sea urchins. Around Shemya Island, remember where there are no sea otters, we have small sea urchins as well, but we have a second peach, a peak of large sea urchins. We can also look at sea urchin biomass, and unsurprisingly on Amchika Island, there's a peak in biomass in the smaller sized sea urchins. The peak in biomass at Shemya Island is with the larger urchins. Even though there's fewer of them, they weigh more. So you get this large peak of biomass. So the principle applied here is to place corresponding words and graphics closer together for deeper learning. The qualities of the two islands are shown at the top rather than in a long kind of legend at the bottom. And there's a graphic to show you which one has sea urchins and which one does not. The lines are labeled with the legend right next to them rather than again at the bottom where your eye has to go to the caption and then figure out what's happening in the graphic itself. So using color and um, lines um, work to label what each of those lines are. Students might re-watch the video, right, and that's one of the benefits that they get from a video versus an in-person or live session, 
um, but they can follow through uh, what each uh, part of the graph is because it comes up um, and because the words are close to the graphs um, in question. The second uh, one I'm going to talk about and the last one is time narration with animation. So the first one was about putting words and graphics close together. This is about timing your narration with the animation. So back to sea otters. I mean, I just like them. What happens to the kelp population when sea otters decline? So this is a food pyramid. So the organisms at the top of the food pyramid eat the organisms below. So if we decrease the number of sea otters, then the number of sea urchins will increase and the kelp forests will decrease their numbers. This is a top down direction of control and it's called a trophic cascade because it works like a waterfall from top down. And the principle applied here is to present graphics alongside narration rather than successively. successively, successively. So like Stephanie with the trombone, the narration happens at the same time that the information comes up and this helps students um, to be able to follow along with what you're saying. The words are there, but they are kept to a minimum of what students need to see. I'm gonna pass it back to Stephanie to summarize. Oh, it's, just kidding. I think that's still me. Is that what you're questioning right now? So in summary, consider if you need a video, uh, then follow the four design principles. Um, before we even talked about the four principles, which are um, avoid redundancy, use visual clues, connect in space and connect in time. We talked about, do I even need a video in the first place? And, um, and so those are four cues and they come from multimodal uh, theory. I'm just gonna admit someone to the room here um, and can be applied to the design um, of your videos. The last little tip um, is to use storyboard to start in your planning. So Stephanie and I started doing this with our PowerPoints and we've carried it over to working with videos and it can feel like a big extra step. But if you've decided that you want to invest the time in creating a video to share content, then this is actually an efficient way to make sure that you um, spend your time well. So when we actually used to spend time together in person, we would often get a big whiteboard and um, storyboard out what we're doing now, and this might be something similar to what you're experiencing, we often are working from existing PowerPoints and turning those into videos. And so then we, this time we actually did the storyboarding right in PowerPoint. So storyboarding doesn't have to be fancy, but the idea is just to plan out what are your, um, how are you gonna actually demonstrate what you're um, saying? And it can also help you see, okay, I feel like I want to share a lot of text here. Maybe this isn't a video. So it helps you work through the decision making process um, of creating a video. So now I really am going to pass it to Stephanie. Yeah, so we wanted to ask you uh, as we just wrap up to take a minute, just take 30 seconds on your own and have a think and then jot down in the chat box uh, one tip from today that you'd like to try in your next video. And I might actually um, we could get Beth to go back to the slide that had the four design principles on it. Um, but it could also be storyboarding or it could be, you know, going through my videos and deciding, do I really need a video for this? So take a moment, take about 30 seconds, and then I'll ask you to just contribute that to the chat box. I will resend the handout. I'm just going to wait till the chat action stops so it doesn't get lost. All right, if you haven't had a chance to throw up a, a next steps for you, then feel free to enter it in the text box now. I see lots of uh, reducing the text on slides, which is very common. To add to that one, I think that's the, been the biggest change since Stephanie and I started doing this work is 
a page with five bullet points is almost always replaced with a really good headline that tells them what the point is and no bullet points. And um, that change can be made way more often than I would imagine um, to my slides. Okay, so thank you everybody to contributing that. I want to second what Beth said. Um, whenever we work on these presentations, we start with research, um, evidence-based research into these practices, and it has completely changed the way that we create, um, create our videos. We make less videos, and we make videos that show and don't tell. We also make um, shorter videos, and we really think about if we're going to ask somebody to invest some time in watching a video, we want to make sure um, that what is in that video is not something that we could just put on a piece of paper or, um, or share an image or write in a quick note. All right, so we have uh, time for some comments and questions. In fact, we have quite a bit of time. Uh, our, the first half hour was just to share content and really the rest of the time is to hear your comments, uh, your questions. We can talk a little bit about ways we created PowerPoints or um, ongoing questions. I might actually get us started back with Jason's question way at the beginning. Can I interrupt um, and, just really yeah. quick first? I'm just gonna stop recording. So um, mm -hmm. if, that, if that helps folks in wanting to speak up instead of type in the chat, feel free to do that. Although we'll take chat questions um, as well.